Well, thank you for all being here. And um, how this started was this spring, we had our annual pottery tour and I invited four of my friends from Britain to show with me. So they flew over, they shipped work, and the, the work that did not sell, I thought, it really needs to come here. I'll talk to minute about the, the four people that shipped work here. The first of all is John Bedding. I've known John for over 50 years. He apprenticed at the same time I did in St. Ives. And when I think of the people that apprenticed there over its 100 year period, He's the one that has work has just changed so radically. It was a, a long, it was a long 50 year uh, uh, journey to get to where he is now. These are thrown, can you believe it? Uh, he developed the process of um, photo emulsion on the pots. He, he designs the, the images on a laptop and then he projects them onto emulsions or something and they're multi-fired and they're just brilliant. Uh, so um, he was the one who I, give credit for for saving the leech pottery. When it was going to be bulldozed, he got people together and raised over a million to save it. And he, he was a director for a period of time and then began to, to grow and grow and grow. Um, he's a dear friend of mine and uh, so his work sold at the tour. So he had to go home, he had three weeks to make work and ship it here. He pulled it off. <laughs> Thanks, John. And the roll off, is uh, the lead potter who trains in the apprentices there, designs the domestic wear. I've known him for a number of years. Uh, he was trained in South Africa and he made his home in St. Ives uh, and he now is the, called the lead potter, a uh, good friend of mine. And John Bedding, who's 75, just got married for the first time. Can you believe it? <laughs> he married a woman who's an artist too and John will make the work and she will design the decoration. This is one of hers, Savannah. She's, she's uh, 51, oh. first marriage. But um, they, I tease them, they live in separate houses and separate villages because they tried to live together and um, it just didn't work out. And, and I get it, telling the story I said to, to John and Savannah, well, when I was with my former partner, we lived half time here in Minnesota, half in Maine. And I said, sometimes 2,000 miles is too close and six months is too long to live together. So whatever works for people and they're happy. And lastly is uh, Cat, Cat Wheeler, who's an American. When they reopened in 2000 and I think it was seven, she applied to go there to work and she wrote uh, lots of grants and got, got a, I think it was a $10,000 grant from some obscure uh, place and she took off and she, there she was and she worked there for maybe a good dozen or so years and married a man from Cornwall and she decided that she was going to leave the leech pottery and just make pots on her own. And I know how difficult that can be. It just brought memories for me from 50 years ago and hauling your work to craft fairs and sell enough just to just to make the entry fee, make a couple hundred dollars. So she now flies to Minnesota in the spring. She ships the work, gets on the plane, and then a train, etc., cetera, and, and shows with us and does very well. So she's on the forever list at the, at the Ace Trek Pottery. And I, she's such a great gal. And what she, uh, I told her the last time, you are the new Lucy Ree of Britain because the British domestic wear, it's called standard wear. So the term is called standard wear. It's kind of brown and round, and it's, it's not terribly interesting, but she has brought an American kind of lick to, to work there. And she, when she worked with me last year, she developed a, a, a process of mixing up slip as thick as frosting and coating the pot and then going back and patterning it without it even cracking. It's, it's amazing. Um, she's had a good, really solid background in ceramic engineering, so she can just work out any glaze and do any kind of slip and pull it off. She's just um, so, uh, I'm just inspired by her work. Uh, anyway, um, I want to talk just first about, I'm dedicating this talk to my mom who passed away 12 years ago, who had a huge impact on my, my life. Uh, she was the number one influence and the second one was my Aunt Judy. She was trained in the early 40s in commercial art. It's now called, I think, graphic arts. And she was just wild. She never married. She smoked 
Paul Mall Straits in that beautiful red package, and she <laughs> drank a lot of alcohol. And, uh, and I just adored her. She was temperamental and moody, but I just loved her. And she'd come down to my house and teach us how to paint and do this, that, and the other. And I couldn't wait to grow up to smoke those cigarettes, drink that <laughs> booze, and be a lesbian. Uh, um, she's long gone, but she was pivotal in my training. When she was 50, she decided she wanted to go back to school and get a certificate to teach high school art. So she went to a small school in northern Minnesota called Bemidji State. It's the home of Paul Bunyan, if you know that, that legend. So that's where I went to school as a freshman. And um, because it was just one of the few schools that would take me on because my grades were not that hot in high school. But I, she said to me, Jeff, take a pottery class. It will change your life forever. So I did, and it changed my life. So I, mom um, had very beautiful clothing and she had beautiful jewelry and I inherited a bunch of it. And I'd like to pass it around. And it wasn't until recently a friend came in and said, of course you would respond to this, it's Art Deco. And my work now is influenced by Art Deco. It never occurred to me that way back when she bought this in Tosco, Mexico in 1962, that how much it had an imprint on me. So I, I brought some of her pieces. It's a, um, a bracelet. I just polished it up. Mom wore this every day of her life. I had to pry it off her arm when she died. And it came to me. But it's just incredible workmanship made in Tosco by Antonio Panada. And this is another one that I inherited, which I love the workmanship of this and the weight of this. I'll just pass this around. And also, um, when I went for my interview in 1968, uh, we came back from Britain on the last trip of the Queen Mary, and my dad bought me a watch on board. It's an Omega watch. Uh, I no longer wear it, it's been restored. And so when I think of this, I think of two of my dad, his generosity, and, and this is an object. I'll pass that around too. It still runs, but I don't wear a watch. I use a cell phone. And this jewelry is by Janet Leach, Bernard's third wife. And when I was there recently, Joe, who was her assistant for many, many years, inherited lots of things of Janet. So one day she came and she gave me all of Janet's jewelry. And I was just stunned. Um, this is Janet's. I have no idea where she got it. Uh, it could be Mexican, I, I just don't know. There's, there's no markings on it. Could be from Mexico, but she was a, um, a, a, a quite an incredible woman. And she was young, uh, she welded ships during the war in New York, and she and her friend get gussied up and they go sneak in the back door of the Cotton Club. So this, this could have been something she wore back then. I don't know, but I have a lot of her jewelry and I just, I just treasure. I think jewelry is, of all the objects in one's possession, they're the ones to me that have the most meaning because they were worn and they have their DNA and it's just loaded with histories. I, I wish I could have the, I knew what this history was. Pass that around too. So I arrived at Bemidji State and my first experience on a wheel was in 1965 in high school. We each had about 50 minutes on a potter's wheel and I remember getting on that wheel for the first time trying to center this one palm ball of clay. It was an Amoco tabletop wheel that had a switch. Was, I and I just thought, okay, this is something. And uh, I, was, I was hooked at, at, at a young age. So um, I went off to Bemidji State and we were required to buy and read the Potter's Book by Leach. At that time in 65, there were only uh, three books out on clay. The Potter's Book, Daniel Red, Rhodes had his book out, Clay and Glazes and Kinney had a book out. And that, that was it. So we just devoured this. And I brought that copy. This is from 1965. And when I went through security, the guy opened this up and looking at I thought, oh, he knows glaze cameras. He, he can help me out. Um, but anyway, you can just see uh, I've marked it up and there's things in the margin. I've tested the glazes, things are marked. And so this is what really got me going in my, my, my love of leech pottery. From, from Bemidji, I transferred to work with Warren McKenzie at the University of Minnesota, who trained at the, at the Leach Pottery in the late 40s with his first wife, Alex. And I remember going to his house the first time. And it's odd, but 
he lived just about three miles from where I grew up. I didn't know that as a kid. So I remember going over there and we chatted and he invited me in for coffee. I remember walking to his house. It had maple floors like this and there were um, lots of pots, contemporary old pots and antique furniture and I just thought, I want this life. It was an instant love of that, the way of living that caught me. And he had a picture that was made by Ann Kierskart. It's a whole other story. I'll, I'll tell it some other point, but uh, I fell in love with that picture. And I didn't know you could fall in love with a piece of pottery. Well, I borrowed that a number of times and uh, to photograph it. And so Warren said years ago, he said, someday it'll be yours. Well, um, I was at his house maybe 10 years ago and I looked up at it and I said, Warren, don't forget about that picture. He said, I didn't tell you that, I didn't say that. Nancy said, I'll remember. Well, she died first, I thought, oh no. So December 25th, I got a call on my cell phone. I was in Minneapolis at a friend's house. It was Tams and his daughter saying, the lawyer was here, someday it'll be yours. <laughs> so uh, four days later, I, I was going through an issue with my pots, I was struggling. And I'd often confer, Warren, help me out with this issue. He, Jeff, just stop torturing yourself with these heavy issues. Just, just keep making, make what you want to make that gives you joy. So anyway, I thought, I want to see him one last time, but his daughter was protecting him. So I thought, how can I get in just to have one last conversation? So I made uh, a bunch of Irish oat cakes and I photographed them with my cell phone. I sent off a text to Tamsin. Could I stop by and just drop these off? Said so any anytime. So I drove down there thinking, I'll see him one last time. I drive in and she walks out on the porch and said, Warren died a couple hours ago, but he's still here. So what is that? So I walk in there, he is dead in the hospital bed in the living room. So I walked up and I put my hand on his head. Said, Warren, I love you, thank you for everything. And I know he would have said the same thing again, just keep making, he made pots up until the, the two weeks before he passed away. And he was an incredible role model. Um, but anyway, uh, I remember going into his office at the U and I said, Warren, I, I want to go apprentice at the Leech Pottery. He said, okay. He took out a pad and he wrote me a letter, sealed it up, and I got on the plane, went over with my parents for the, my, my interview. And so Janet Leach was taking me through the studio. I, was, I had a sport coat on. I was, you know, looked really smart. And she pointed to a nick on the wall and she said, if these walls could talk, they'd have some story to tell. That's where Michael Carter threw a teapot across the room at, at Bernard and hit the wall there. So I thought, wow. And she said, if these walls could talk, there'd be some story. And I said, okay which is true, I had no idea what I was getting into. But, so I came back and I finished my degree and just before I was to leave, I got my draft papers. It was the height of the Vietnam War. <clears throat> but I flunked the physical, so I was allowed to leave. So <clears throat> two nights ago, I couldn't sleep because I was just anxious about talking in front of you. And this morning I called up Deb, my friend, I'm so anxious about this, I'm talking. how long is it? It's 15 minutes and she's, oh, you could talk longer than that. I just hope there's a hook that you can be hooked off the stage. <laughs> once I get going, once I have an audience, I just go on for hours. So when you've had enough, just hook me. Um, so I found letters that I wrote to my parents. Every week I'd write them through my apprenticeship. And I dug them out. My, my mom saved everything. Uh, and when I cleaned out the house, I grabbed the file of them. Uh, it says, dear family, receive your letter. I'm finally in St. Ives. What an ordeal getting here. When I got to the London airport, I took a bus to the downtown terminal and then a cab to my hotel, which was right across the street from the coach station. The hotel was very fancy. Got a ticket to St. Ives, which was much running around because you have to buy the ticket in advance. Mrs. Leach was waiting for me at the train station. Does she like her whiskey? <laughs> so um, I remember her picking me up in her yellow sports car. She had sports car, I remember she had a Morgan and she had a yellow Triumph that's called Buttercup and the top was down. She met me there and I put in my luggage and, and I had no idea what an apprentice was about. Warren didn't say a word. And I, I, and I, thought, I thought, oh, we're gonna have tea in the lawn. I think I packed three beach outfits. And <laughs> it was, uh, I certainly learned, learned it was just, it was a lot of work. So she picks me up and she drives the wrong way down a one-way street and St. Ives, 
is a town from the 13th century. The streets are narrow. They're like one-way streets. If you went down the wrong way, you just pull up on, on the side like this, half like this, and we'd go into the pub, the back room, and we had a couple of whiskeys for lunch, and I thought, well, I'm in the right place. <laughs> um, um, but anyway, she showed me my flat, which is a hole, then to, to their house where Bernard had dinner waiting. Um, they just got back from Japan. The flat's a dump, et cetera. Okay, no fridge, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then this is the second letter I sent to them. Um, we went to Mary's house. We watched the landing of the Apollo back in 1969. But then this is the fun part is that I wrote back and said, this is my first day of working. I made 60 bowls, and Bill only saved two of them. They're only two up to standard. And he said, sometimes it takes a good four months before you're, you're trained in. I thought, oh, this is going to be hell. <laughs> um, and it was hell. But it was really, I had the best time of my life. I loved it, and I hated it. Um, my parents decided they're going to come over and visit, I think, to just check up on me. So they came after, I'd been there a couple months. By the time they got there, I had smoked my first joint. I had scotch for lunch. I slept with a woman for the first time. And I'm a gay man. So I, I feel I really grew up there. And they fell in love with the town. And in their lifetime, they went there 77 times to St. Ives. And they, they rented the same flat, which is a couple doors from Bernard. And they became good friends. And so I think we'll start with images. Oh, there's mom. This is taken the year that he passed away, 1979. That's my mom, she was 50. There's Bernard, and that's Trudy, his companion, who cooked for him. They, Janet and Bernard didn't live together. They did for five years, and they kind of separated. But anyway, um, Trudy was hired to do Bernard's correspondence and to cook for him and entertain. But I, um, so that's mom, I, I have that necklace. Um, in the pottery, as my, it's my shrine to mom with photographs of her, that necklace and other objects from that era. Um, but anyway, when she was in the nursing home is when I, I began, I just fell in love with her jewelry, and it's just started taking things. And before she died, she gave me her sorority pin. It's here. And on the back, it says 1936, um, Audriana Nielsen, her, her maiden name, and so she gave it to me, and I wore it for the first time going out to Bradley University, somewhere on the uh, eastern part of America. I got there, it was gone. It fell off, it just, it just was gone, and I was heart sick. So I got home, and I looked at the flashlight around where the car is parked, I couldn't find it. I was just sick about it. And I put uh, a, a, the, the small town that she was raised in in Iowa, I put a thing in the, in the newspaper that uh, lost a pin, Audrey and Nielsen, thinking maybe someone will you know, connect. And, Nothing happened for maybe eight years. And then one day I got a uh, text that we've, we found a pin with Audrey and Nielsen. It's at our sorority house. Call this number. I kept calling. They wouldn't, they wouldn't return calls. I sent certified letters. I sent a $500 reward, nothing. They would not respond. I have a file this big. And I was talking to Deb one day. She said, Jeff, it's tearing you apart. Just let go of it. It will come back. Let go. And last year I got a phone call from pilots. That I found this on the floor at the airport and I cleaned up my desk. I'm a pilot. We have it. Uh, we'll ship it overnight. So it was shipped overnight and I had it restored and a safety thing put on. But, so when I wear this, I think of hope and I, I think of faith. And I think that, that idea of faith and hope is how one of the anxieties of uh, when you're a young potter, how are you going to survive this? How are you going to make a living? You're going to starve to death. And you just, you just run on hope. And so I learned um, kind of midway through that you just run on hope. Things are going to work out. They're, it's going to work out in one way or the other. So anyway, um, so when I uh, arrived in St. Ives, um, there's another picture of me on the wheel. This is the shirt. This is a copy. Um, I found that fabric in Florida and I had a friend copy the shirt and um, it's got a hole in it down there. The um, button was missing so I have that little thing there. But that's, that's me on the wheel in 1969 um, going through my ABCs. 
learning to make uh, lids to a soup bowl. Next one will be, that's me 50 years later. I went back uh, when I, to bury my, to put my parents' ashes there. And I said, I want to do residency and work in that same spot. So I just worked alone in that cold studio. It's a museum now on a leash wheel. Um, 50 years later, that, oh my, that was really eerie. Uh, it was just, okay, we do this. Okay, next. So this is me on the right when I was there, I think 1970. Bernard doing a book signing. He had just finished his last book. And uh, so I was there for signing. That's his so third wife, Bernard at 92, I think it is. And he is a young boy. Next. Again, another shot. And that's Shin Yoshi. He arrived there when I was there from Tamba, Japan. It's, he was from a pottery that Janet Leach trained at in 1953 to 55. And he, his pottery went back 700 years, and he had just inherited it from his ancestors. So uh, seeing that's where Janet lived at one point, she invited him over to work. And their diet was changing in Japan. So he came over to learn how to make English pots, to make pitchers with handles and to make dinner plates and all that. And we became best friends. He passed away maybe about 10 years ago. Next. Um, this is Bernard. This is was true that this is the, the year they passed away. My mom took this photograph next. Um, but when I think of my training there, it came from, from kind of three sources. One of them was the daily making of pots. We made hundreds of pots every week. Uh, we didn't have a lot of discussions. It was just the making was the, the teacher. And also, we had access to Michael Cardo, Hamada, Lucy Reed came down to visit. So we chumped up to the greats back then. That was part of my education. And um, so this is at Cardo's went up for a picnic one day. And the third source was um, Bernard had a collection, a fabulous collection of old historic pots. We had access to those. And so they were teachers. And I have a huge collection of historic pots now. I love pots from the past um, that, that still inform me. So this is the so-called standard wear. And I remember early on talking about standard wear. No one knew what it was. It's a term that Bernard invented in 1930-something towards a standard, that chapter in his book. Um, when you look up standard wear in America, the dictionary, it just says there's two references, one about this, and the other is there's a software company called Standard Wear. So that's what we learned, and they put me on that soup bowl, number 14, the first time. I made thousands until they came up to a standard. It took me a couple of months to just throw them away. This is good. And then, but anyway, you, you um, through the years, you just got so in tune to the, the shape, though. When I was there the last time, I took a ball of clay, and my hands just made that bowl. It was just, it's in your DNA. And you look at my pots now, which is, there's a heavy art deco influence. You strip away all the cutting and faceting and this and that and decoration. Underneath that are, is the leech standard wear. And when you look at Warren's pots too, once you go through that rigorous training, that's the basis of your, of your form structure. <coughs> and John Betting, this is his piece. This is him learning to decorate 53 years ago. And Bernard would assign one person to do the decoration on, they were called Z bowls. And he chose John Betting because he had a painting background. And he told me that day, he said that, that Bernard gave him the brushes, the pigment, and he had to practice on newspaper for a week, getting these three strokes down. <coughs> and then he would get some old bisque where he'd practice on. Then he could finally decorate them. And I found one at an auction recently. I gave mine to a museum years ago. I wanted another one. And I found one that you do, I could tell he decorated. He was the best decorator. And he said that he can still pick up that brush. He knows that pattern. He's just good with a the brush. There's Libby uh, cooking for us. She came over in Sika, and she stayed with me and the leech, and she cooked for us. And I think there's one more. Um, this was recently, a couple months ago, at this tour. And I realized that I just, it was a tour. I invite potters from all over the country and all over the, from England. And all. We have these big meals together. And I'm just thinking, I just, every second, I love that because I live alone with two cats because my household, as a child, there were six of us kids. It was chaotic. I just wanted to live alone way out in the country. But I do get, sometimes get, get, I get lonesome. So I just felt this is my family. This is community. And I began to think about, yes, um, making pots uh, 
and being here and my mom's jewelry and all that, it creates a family. That's what crafts do. And to me, that's the most important function of crafts is it creates a family and then the pots are passed on and they develop this rich history. And I'm here because of Bernard and being part of this community. So I think that's it. I think that's it. For the, I think that's all. Okay. Thank you. Any questions? Did you say the Japanese part was Shinyoka? No, it was Shinji Ichino from Tamba. And he inherited it from his grandfather and he shipped his wheel over. It was a momentum wheel that had a wood head on it. And he was an incredible thrower. He was very skilled. And um, so he's no longer alive though, but we were dear friends back then. And how old were you when you started your apprenticeship? I was 21, yes. And, um, but when I think of, uh, when I came back from England, I modeled my pottery after the leech pottery. I developed some standard wear, which that just failed. I tried making tiles, which the leech did in the 30s. That all failed. Everything I tried just failed. I tried having Raku Sundays. Bernard, when he moved to St. Ives in 1920, they had what's called Raku Sundays. There's a raccoon kiln, and then he would have bisque where people would just come and decorate them. That's how he got the public in. I tried that, you know, 45 years ago. Only one person showed up. Gary showed up. And it just was a failure. So I thought, I have to, how am I going to live off this? But I, what I did from the very beginning was I had yard sales like Warren McKenzie had. And I'd invite other artists to come, and we'd set up, and every couple, three months, we'd have a event at my place and we'd sell work and slowly the list begins to grow and it just begins to unfold um, slowly. But I, I do, when I talk to friends who are potter friends, that we talk about how making pots, there's not many rewards. You don't get the teacher of the year award or anything. You, it's, the reward is in the work itself. And um, that's enough for me. It's just the, the daily making of pots. And, I will be making until my last breath because I don't save money, I spend it on things of beauty. Um, so I'm still working at 75 and that's not a bad sentence, is it? Still making, okay, thank you. Did you ever have an apprentice? No, I'd never. But when I arrived there in 69, Janet said, go out into the, the stock room and choose a mug which you're going to have your tea out of every day for two years. So I went and I picked this out I don't know why, but the pots that I bought as a young person, I bought them because I wanted to learn something. I bought uh, pots that say had ash glaze on which I was struggling with. And I don't know why I bought this. Th that's, that's a dumb sign. It's a <laughs> tiny bit. That's in English. The houses are small. Everything is small. And it, it, it got broken shipping. It's, it's, been, it's been mended. I haven't used this in 50 years. I used it last night at Carol's. It's got a dumb handle I couldn't put my fingers through. It doesn't make any sense, but for some reason it spoke to me. So I decided when I get back home, I'm going to make a series of these and I'm going to reinvent it and put my information in it to see, just trying to figure out what is it about that a long time ago um, spoke to me. Thank you. Yes? Can you tell us about Lucy Reed? What's your memories of Lucy Reed? I met her once. She came down once to visit Bernard, and I didn't know this uh, for quite some time, that Bernard was in love with Lucy Rhee. And you know, she immigrated from Germany, from Bauhaus, and, and uh, Bernard went up every other weekend to try to woo her, but she would not knuckle because Bernard demanded of his wives a traditional wife that would cook and clean and iron, and that's not Lucy. She knew she married Bernard, that would just ruin her life as a potter. But they were dear friends and she came down once, I'll never forget, um, she walked in and she had a brown skirt and a matching tweed thing and she sat down by the fireplace. She didn't say a single word for a half hour. Bernard was yakking about this, that and the other and I just fell in love with her, her humility. And um, a, a remarkable woman and I regret at that time, Janet Leach started a, a 
two galleries in town. One of them was called the New Craftsman's Gallery. It's still going after 50, 60 years. There was a corner cupboard. We walked in, and there were Hamada vases, Lucy Reeves vases with the narrow necks, um, Hans Koper, the spade vase. They were $100 each. And I, I didn't buy any. I was only paid $15 a week because that's my salary. I could have, you know, I could have managed that, but I was in love with Bill Marshall's pots who trained me in, bought a lot of his. I regretted that. When I came back to America, there was a show of her pieces at a Danish furniture store in Minneapolis that Warren organized. So I went to it and I bought a vase of hers. But when some land came up around me for sale 30 years ago, I sold the, that vase to buy the land and I call that field my Lucy field. And I'm, I'm gonna sell some land so I can add on to the house one last time. I'm not gonna sell that piece of land because that's sacred land. Thank you, Lucy. But um, she was a remarkable woman. I had great respect for her. And Hans Kolper as well. And Cardu, all of them. And I just think of how my experience there was just the best timing of when you think of the 100 years of the leech pot. It could have been sweeter. It was making money. Janet wasn't uh, tame, was a more tame, and we were able to get along fairly well, and it was just a magical time. Okay. Was that over 15? I think it was. Sorry about that. Where's that hook? Images of your stuff at all? No. I didn't put it in because Warren McKenzie was asked once, do you use your own pots? And he said, no, it's like talking to yourself. So I just have two pots in my house that are mine, this old cup, and I have a dinner plate. It was a second because I needed another plate. I, and I, the, the one, one thing I regret is when I have a, a firing, I unstack and then it's sold right off the bat. I, I, I'm always last minute. And so I don't have a chance to get to know them. They're just gone. And I really need to hold back on that and give them a chance to talk to me. But Warren said to me that when he would unstack his skin, it was always disappointing. He said, I'd go away for a day, we'd come back and look at the pots under their own terms. And then you can see possibilities. And I think that was good advice that I wish I could follow.